Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, my co-host Joe Stewart and I speak with inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're well and had a great holiday season. I also hope that 2021 brings you much joy. Can't be much worse than 2020, right? I really hope that I don't regret saying that. So we have an excellent first episode for the year. It's a conversation with Marsha Banks-Harold. I spoke on a panel along with Marsha for Global Yoga Therapy Day a while back, and I thought she was just amazing. So we had to ask her to come on the podcast, and I'm so glad that she agreed. Marsha is a certified yoga therapist, a trauma-sensitive yoga facilitator, and the owner of Pies Fitness Yoga Studio based in Alexandria, Virginia. Marsha thrives in creating a supportive, inclusive, diverse, adaptive and accessible yoga and yoga therapy experience for all and she specialises in working with marginalised communities. We had a fun and wide-ranging conversation with Marsha covering topics from her background in electrical engineering and how that informs her teaching, the Black Lives Matter movement and also how she creates inclusive, accessible spaces both online and in person. Now, before we get into our conversation, I just wanted to throw in a short plug for our studio, Garden of Yoga. We've recently put together a couple of video courses on our website. One is focused on computer cranky spots and contains yin yoga, chair yoga and nurturing yoga and Pilates sessions for the neck, back, shoulders and hips. The other is an aerial yoga for beginners and beyond course. In this course, we focus on clarity, safety and strategies to help all bodies feel comfortable in the aerial hammock. You can find both of these on our website at gardenofyoga.com.au slash learn and they're only $25 each for hours and hours of classes. All right, that's more than enough talking from me. Let's get into the conversation with Marsha Banks Harold. Marsha, thank you so much for catching up with us today. It's so great to get the chance to speak with you. Perhaps you could just start by telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Yes, well, thank you guys for having me today. I actually grew up in Alexandria, Virginia. I have lived there my whole life with the exception of the time that I went to engineering school in Blacksburg, Virginia at Virginia Tech University. And so I'd love to know what drew you to electrical engineering. I'm glad you asked that question as well. I loved math and science. When I was in elementary school, middle high, and also high school, I realized that numbers just fascinated me. And so I spent a lot of time just having fun with numbers. And that's how I became an electrical engineer. And so... To people who are just listening, that sounds pretty different to yoga, but I'm sure there are a lot of commonalities and crossovers because there are quite a few famous yogis who are also engineers. How did you discover yoga? Well, actually, I discovered yoga because I had reached a glass ceiling in my career as an electrical engineer. And what I realized is that I was imbalanced in my life, even though I was doing really well intellectually, physically, I was in the best shape of my life, running 10 miles a day, doing Zumba, dancing. I just loved the life that I had. I was fortunate that you know my husband and I had a great life. We had two biological children at that time, but I was really not at peace within myself. And so one weekend, I went away actually for a week to Williamsburg, Virginia. And during that time, I really learned about yoga. I met a person who introduced me to yoga, even though I thought I didn't have time for yoga. That's for people that just sit around and do nothing. I'm an overachiever. I'm a trailblazer. So I need more active materials in order to keep my attention. But that's really how I came to it. I I needed peace in my life. I needed to figure out who I was from an authentic perspective. And that's what I got from my yoga teacher training, actually. Nice. And was it a bit of a sort of struggle actually making that adjustment? Or did you find you just sort of fell into it? Oh, no, it was a huge struggle for me. I I remember my first Shavasana crying profusely at the end of class. 
I didn't really realize what was happening. Now I know from all my studies that it was the trauma that I had experienced that was stored in my body that was coming out. I also did not understand why I needed to slow down. I felt initially ineffective in my ability to show up and be present in the world. But as I continued to work through the physical postures and I continued to study the philosophy, I realized that what I really needed in my life was balance. And so the practice allowed me to unpack a lot of things, a lot of experiences that had caused harm to me in my life. And so through yoga, I was able to eventually, it took me some time though, I I really struggled to be okay slowing down to getting in, in sequence with the actual natural rhythm of my mind, my body, and my spirit. There's a perception that's even reached Australia that as a black person, and especially as a black woman, you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And I'm hearing that sentiment in how you've explained your career and driving and pushing yourself so hard and then reaching that glass ceiling, which must have been so frustrating. Was there a thought in your mind that like, if I don't keep pushing and keep striving, like nothing's going to happen for me. And then yoga is kind of telling you the opposite where you just have to be and slow down. I'd really appreciate your perspective on that. Sure. Yes. Um, in fact, that's what the struggle was. My parents' mantra to me was you have to do better than everyone else in the world. There's no time to sit down and rest and just be average. And so I had that belief system from an early age. I remember I cried the first time I got a B. I didn't know how to really accept myself. I thought that in order to be successful in this world, that I had to have straight A's from an academic perspective. I had to achieve every promotion that was available. And what really was, what I know now was the hard part is I didn't even take time to make sure that I was well. And so even though I was physically well, my emotions and mental health was not really at the best place. And so the conflict, when I read the sutras, when it encouraged me to be at peace, to clear the mind stuff, I thought, how in the world can I do that and be successful? But what happened is that when I continue to read the sutras, when I continue to adapt the principles from the sutras and the Bhagavad Gita, then I realize that really I have become more present in my actions. I am extremely more successful in my engineering job. I'm able to mentor other colleagues who also struggled with creating that balance between who they were in terms of their work and also in terms of their family. So honestly, Yoga saved my life because when I did not, when I hit that glass ceiling, I really thought that I had no purpose. The sutra that speaks to me is about your identity. You're tied so much to your identity, to the titles that you have in your career and your home and your community. And when I did not get that final promotion, I felt hopeless I felt that I had no purpose in my life. And that's why I retreated for a week. And I'm so grateful for that studio in Williamsburg, Virginia, because they didn't know how low I was. And because of that week of practicing, I wanted to explore how this practice, this scientific method of yoga could save someone like me. And so after just practicing for one week, I signed up for yoga teacher training and I am just so grateful because it saved my life and it allows me to help me serve others that are struggling with the same concept of being an overachiever and struggling internally without having anyone to chat with. So powerful and so beautiful that you are paying this gift forward and supporting other people, especially when it's something that you just, sounds like you stumbled upon it. I'm also really intrigued. Do you notice any similarities between the practice and maybe even the philosophy of yoga and engineering? 
Most definitely. I think that's what really caught my attention most because I struggled. Am I going to have to let go of the way that I think as an engineer? I really appreciate the processing that occurs in engineering. It allows me to be successful. When I study yoga and continue to study yoga, I realized that yoga is also very process oriented, especially when I look at yoga therapy. You have the intake process. You have this assessment. You have the protocol delivery and protocol development. And so for me, seeing the systems that were present in both of those modalities, modalities really allowed me to help myself, but also my clients. A lot of clients that come to me are engineers, lawyers, scientists, powerful executive leaders. And so they're they're drawn to the skill set that I have and the fact that yoga allows me to be more peaceful and they want those skills. They want that ability to tap into their authentic selves and to continue to thrive and be successful in the world that we live in. It's so interesting because that's such an esoteric concept in some ways, but I can hear from your process that you have a real structure and a real progression. And I can see how that would appeal to people who come from a world where that's how they structure their own days and their own lives. Like there's something really familiar and reassuring in that. Yes, it definitely is. I think that the people that come to me for yoga therapy and for yoga, they understand my mindset. They understand the concept of checking your calendar, making sure that you are strategic and how you lead your day, but also the piece that you kind of alluded to about being a Black woman. There's this principle that Dr. Gail Parker talks about the Sojourner Truth Syndrome and That principle really helped me a lot when I read her book, because what I realized is that I was missing the well-being concept of that. I was pushing really hard, and so are my clients, the high-power attorneys, the engineers. They are pushing as well, but when I talk to them, they understand that I really get it that I really understand that they're not able to cut back like a whole lot, but they're able to be present in the moment that they're in and still be just as successful and even more successful. My 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 productivity and efficiency increased. And so that's why people come to me because they don't want to like underachieve. They want to be able to continue to be successful at the same time as balancing their life from a more peaceful perspective. Beautiful. And as you were uh, coming into yoga, did you have any key teachers? Well, that's a great question. Actually, my very first teacher was Becky McCrigger, and she was the teacher in Williamsburg, Virginia, that really serves as my guide for, for my entry into yoga, she accepted me when I had limited knowledge of what yoga even was. She really made a pathway for me. She she empowered me by telling me that she sensed the spiritualness about me, that even though I didn't have the specific skill set from the physical posture piece, she noticed like based on the kosher model, that my intellect, the emotional piece, and the spiritual piece were so developed that she was willing to give me, to actually hold space for me while I learned the physical pieces. So she is really the teacher that I give most credit to because if she hadn't given me the opportunity to come in being really new to yoga, I wouldn't be the yogi that I am today. So I'm really grateful for her. And so was she also your inspiration for becoming a yoga therapist or did that come later? That actually became a part of my to-do list later. When I started teaching yoga, ironically, the clients that were coming to me initially, so that was back in 2009, I got certified at the 200-hour level the clients that were coming to me were struggling with their spiritualness as well. And so they were asking me all kinds of questions about how to balance their lives, how to deal with relationships, how to deal with workplace issues and concerns, how to deal with family matters. And so I just one day woke up and decided 
I need to get some more training around this. And so I became a yoga therapist because of the type of questions that my clients were asking me. And I wanted to make sure that I had the knowledge base to be effective. I guess that's where the engineering part comes in. I always want to validate everything that I felt spiritually. And how did opening up your own studio space, Pies Fitness Yoga, come into this timeline? Were you already, like, did you already have your own studio? And what was your inspiration for creating your own space? Yes. So I, the reason that I opened my own studio is not as positive as some of the other things that we've chatted about so far today. Being a Black woman in the engineering world, I realized that I was usually the only one from a trauma perspective, I was othered. I was the only manager. I was the only woman, the only person of color in many of my meetings. And what I realized is that I felt that same way in the yoga world. In fact, when I came back to Alexandria, Virginia to start practicing yoga, the studios weren't as welcoming as as I wanted them to be. I felt the same level of disconnect and non-welcoming in the studios that I went into in the city that I live in. And I honestly did not want to repeat what I was experiencing in my engineering job. And so What I decided to do was to open up my own space because I knew there were other people out there who also didn't feel welcomed. There were other people that had maybe different body sizes or their gender preference was not the same as what a majority of the people in the yoga community expect people to look like or to be like. And so I knew there was a need. I knew there was a need to hold space for people from marginalized communities. I knew what it was like being a powerful woman, being a powerful Black woman in engineering. So I wanted to create a space where people could literally show up as who they were in their lives with no judgment for who they were if it was different than the people that showed up as the majority in the yoga studio. So I opened it because I really was not treated the way that I feel all beings should be treated. That's huge that you've just come from unpacking your own trauma and realizing how you need to like take this time for yourself and for your own well-being and then to take on the responsibility for creating and holding a safe space where everyone in your community and people from all communities can kind of just be with themselves and be in this welcoming nurturing environment like that's so much to take on were you Was that a stressful time or did you just feel like you were so fired up by wanting to make a change that that carried you through? Yes, um, definitely it was a combination. I was fired up, honestly, and I still am. My studio opened in 2010 and I still am passionate about these matters. It's really I'm a mother of two special needs children as well. I became the legal guardian to these two children in 2000 and, ooh, I can't remember the year, 2008. So almost 13 years ago. And what I realized is that we have a responsibility, especially as yogis, to hold space for all beings. And I realized that I really was energized by this work. I realized like, oh, I'm a social activist. I can really hold space. So when people walk into my yoga studio, even now via Zoom, when they log in, there are people that literally cry because they feel so welcomed. They seem valued here and they know that this is a safe space for them. So it actually empowered me to really continue with this work. I have special needs clients, aging population, those overachievers that I call trailblazers that show up in my space. It, they empower me and I empower them. So I don't get burned out with it because I need this community. If I didn't have this safe space, then I know that the trauma that I've already unpacked will resurface. I will be re-traumatized. So I'm grateful for each and every one of my clients because when I show up, if I've had a challenging day, they hold space for me as well. That's how it works at my space. And so you do so much and 
even though you kind of speak about that energy that you get back from the people that you connect with, I know that at the end of a really deep session with someone or just being with the energies of lots of different people through your day and being really present with them and drawing on the technical knowledge as well of yoga therapy and all of that stuff that's happening in your mind about what you're going to do next and how the time is going and all of those other things beyond being really present in those sessions, you must have a very dialed in self-care personal practice to stay energized and to not burn out and to not feel drained with everything that you have going on would you like to share some of those personal practices with us that keep you keep you fired up and not burnt out yes definitely really it starts when I first open my eyes I'm just so grateful and so I lay there for a moment and just for me it's about God But for me, I thank God for allowing me to wake up in the morning. And then I have my meditative time where I sit, I quiet my mind, I quiet my spirit. I really just think about all my ancestors that made so many sacrifices so that I can be where I am today. Because my great grandmother, she was actually a slave. And so when I think about the progress, the fact that I'm an electrical engineer, that I'm a studio owner, that I'm the director of yoga therapy training programs and yoga teacher training programs, that gratitude is really the first part of my self-care. And then the meditation, because I know my mind can go really, really, really fast. And so to sit for some time with myself is really, really important. And then I have a cup of tea. My parents gave me the mantra of being the best at everything that I could be, but they also taught me about the importance of sitting down and having a cup of tea in the morning and even throughout the day. So I sit with myself. I drink a cup of tea when my children awaken, they join me as well in a cup of tea. So tea is really an important part of my self-care practice. And then on top of that, I have something positive that I read every morning before I start my day. So I have a couple emails that come in that really just reading the the headline gets me going for the day. You know, be at peace, be encouraged. That's really all it takes. And finally, my physical practice. Um, Yin is really the practice, either Yin or restorative yoga are what I go to first because I need that time to rest to recover, to recenter myself. And if I've had a really challenging day where the energy that I've received from myself or from my clients is really kind of really intense in my body, then I'll do a vinyasa practice. I do that about twice a week where I just kind of really slowly power through the postures, but being present. So that's really my self-care. I do it every day. Uh, You would have to do it every day to keep up with all of the other things that you have in your day. And for me, if I'm doing too much, the, the thing my brain does is either puts appointments on the wrong day or forgets appointments that I have. Do you have any subtle or obvious messages from your mind or your, or your body when you might be doing too much? Yes, most definitely. My brain is really great at saying, hello, Marsha. It's time to just rest. And so for me, when I reach my limit, then what I'll do is just sit on my couch. I will either call one of my sons that's away in college. I have two in college and two at home. And so I'll call one of them and just say, hey, can you come over and sit with me or give me a hug today? So my brain literally just says, you cannot process yet another thing. So I just want you to sit and connect with your family. And also what I'll do is call my mother because my mother, she has this really great positive demeanor. And so when I talk to her, my brain just says, call your mom, call your mom. And when I sit with her, I don't even have to tell her that life has become heavy. She knows it. And she will give me some kind, encouraging words that will allow me to continue generally the next day after I've rested for the evening. 
Oh, so your brain is so efficient. <laughs> Straight in there with exactly what you need. It's so good. <laughs> Well, the thing is, you know, when I came to yoga in 2008, I did not have good boundaries. I I was a workaholic. I say now I'm a recovering workaholic. I know my schedule is still packed, but it's different. Before I was sleeping with my BlackBerry, I was answering emails within three minutes. I, I didn't have boundaries between home and work. I would come home from work and if my job called me back, I wouldn't even have dinner with my family. So my schedule now has built in time for myself and for my family. And that's the difference. Yoga really allowed me to be presently active and actively present in my life. And so I'm so grateful that I found yoga because it literally profoundly impacted me and my family. And I can just imagine how that experience would be so helpful for everyone that you work with because it sounds like you've made some big changes but you're still the person, you're still you, you've just found this way of being in the world that supports your own well-being rather than expends all of your energy outwards. There's like that internal checking in and time for recovery as needed. And I know that you work privately and in small groups with clients who might be affected by complex and microaggressive trauma. Would you like to share a little bit about this process and maybe for people who aren't used to working with these populations or who work with these populations and don't even realise it because trauma affects so many people in so many ways, how might this trauma history affect someone's experience in class? That's a great question as well. Complex trauma is really this concept of where a person has been impacted multiple times by traumatic events or experiences in their life. And also microaggressive trauma, these subtle traumatic experiences that occur based on race generally or just marginalized communities are impacted mostly by microaggressive trauma. And so what happens when my clients show up in the studio, I know that they have been impacted. I'm I'm an intuitive person as well. So first I feel it in my own body, in my mind and in my spirit. And what happens is the way that they show up, the way that my students show up, then I create a practice that's really designed to bring about healing in their mind and in their body and in their spirit. And so a lot of times, well, I have a check-in process for every single class. I mean, actually, you know, we're required to do that as yoga therapists, but in my group yoga therapy classes, my clients will show up and just tell me, I had this experience at work today where my supervisor was demeaning to me or devaluing, and it wasn't like explicit. It was really just kind of subtle, but I still feel it in my body. So are you able to give me an idea of how I can work through that? And so I, I really kind of create on the spot a sequence that meets that person where they are. And and usually that one person that shares will spark someone else to say, you know, I had a similar situation in my workplace as well this week. And so I'm, I'm just really grateful that I found this practice. Honestly, before the George Floyd incident that happened here, I didn't really talk about microaggressions. I didn't talk about complex trauma because I felt that in order for me to fit into this world, I think that's another syndrome that we as Black people are taught, that you don't really talk about it. You kind of stuff your emotions, which is part of that trauma that was in my body. So I'm grateful that I'm able to use my practice and to share it with my clients so they can understand that what they're feeling is real. I know so many times in my career as an electrical engineer, I experience situations where people are not so kind, they're demeaning or devaluing, and I would go home and cry and wonder, why is this happening to me? But when I've studied trauma from the complex aspect of it, as well as the microaggression and also psychological safety aspect, I realized that what I'm feeling in my body and my mind and my spirit is real. And so I can utilize yoga therapy to bring about the well-needed healing 
that will allow me to get back up, to go back to work and continue to thrive and be abundant. Yeah, we were lucky enough to talk to Dr. Gail Parker on our podcast and to read her book as well. And I really learned so much about the effect that those constant microaggressions can have on your psyche and your well-being because there's just not an adequate time to recover after yes. each one and individually they all look really subtle so as well as the effect of the trauma there might also be what you described that sense of am I overreacting is this really something that's worth getting upset about is this just happening to me and I think through what you're sharing and books like Dr Gail Parker's for people who don't come like I'm a white woman so I get sexism <laughs> Right. in the workplace, but it's not on the same level and I wouldn't characterise it as trauma for me. So I think that sharing experiences of other people, different communities and the way that people are received by the world is really powerful because as a yoga teacher, it's not just about your experience, it's about creating a safe space for everyone and being informed about what people might have faced through their day before they show up on their mat can just give you that other layer of awareness and maybe sensitivity and it might take the form of not touching someone without asking which I think in this day and age is pretty much across the board we don't really touch people in class without getting full enthusiastic consent And that's a really obvious example, but I'd love it if you could share some of the other ways you go about creating a supportive, inclusive and kind of adaptive and accessible yoga and yoga therapy experience for everyone who shows up in your classes and in your groups. Yes, definitely. Well, the most specific example that I can provide for you is that I address every client by their name. I actually take the time when people call me to inquire about my yoga studio or about the classes or yoga therapy. I actually am in the present moment with them. I listen to their story because it's important, especially when you're dealing with marginalized communities, people that haven't traditionally been been seen or heard or valued to just create what I call compassionate sharing experiences where You take the time, regardless of what's happening in your life in that moment, to really listen to the person that's before you, to listen to their stories, to unpack what's happening in their lives. And when you do that through the intake process, then you're able to adaptively provide the sequence that's best for the person that's before you. You know, in yoga, we have this concept, honor where people are. Honor the person that's before you, accept the person that's before you. And in order to do that, you really have to have done your own self-study to know how you show up in this world. And then taking the time to build relationships with every being, regardless if they're different from you, is, is what I do. So I really love the opportunity to manage and actually oversee my yoga studio spaces because everybody that shows up, whether they come in using a walker or cane, whether they can't see like they've lost their sight, maybe they have mental disabilities or emotional disabilities, executive functioning disorder. There's so many things, so much trauma that's resonating in this world. So creating the safe space It's just really about listening to the person that's before you. Hello, Ron here to talk about our Patreon page. Patreon is just a way that you can help support the podcast for as little as $1 US a month. Higher tiers get access to extra special content as well as a listing on our website and a shout out on the podcast. If you'd like to help us out with a small monthly donation, just go to patreon.com slash flowartistpodcast and join the fun. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can just share this episode on social media, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or just reach out and let us know your thoughts on this or anything else. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Marsha. Mm. 
And you mentioned earlier, I guess, murder of George Floyd, and that's obviously affected a lot of people in the United States and across the whole world. But I was wondering, did you notice an immediate effect in your own community? Most definitely. I can tell you, which I kind of alluded to before, before George Floyd, I didn't really talk about racial trauma. I didn't talk about what it was like to be a Black woman, being a Black woman engineer, being a Black woman yoga teacher, being a Black woman yoga therapist, director of my training programs. I just stuffed all of that in. And when I saw the murder of George Floyd, and when I heard him call out for his mother, for his mama, that brought about a shift in me. I'm a mother of four Black sons. And so when I saw that, I realized that I could no longer continue to sit quietly and silently about this matter. In fact, the racial trauma studies that I've done subsequently says that you have a choice. You can take action You can speak up and hold space for a community of people that have been impacted by trauma, or you can continue to be quiet and stand on the sidelines and not really hold space. And so for me, yes, my community has really been impacted by this. My sons are impacted. They're nervous about going outside if they wear their favorite hoodie, especially as the weather changes. My my oldest son that's in Atlanta at Morehouse University, you know, when he's driving his Mercedes Benz while black, there's a reality that he has to think about when he's driving. The impact of George Floyd in Atlanta has really, really escalated because a lot of my son's colleagues and classmates have been targeted by the police department. And so it's really important that in times like these, after the George Floyd moment, that we really acknowledge that people are suffering They're hurting. There's fear around this. So this is a great opportunity, actually, to create more opportunities. In fact, I did the same. I created a class where I hold once a month for BIPOC members that are looking for a safe space just to come and talk about what's happening in their lives. In addition to that, since I am inclusive also, I'll be adding another class in the next month or so around the concept of inclusivity. So a class for all beings, because I don't want any of my clients, I don't want anyone in this world to feel that they're excluded just because they're not a part of my particular community, the Black community. I hold space for all beings, and that's how I run my space. Everyone is welcomed here. Have you noticed much of a change in the local yoga community, which initially did not feel very welcoming and very inclusive? Have you felt a bit of a shift in awareness through everything that's going on in America right now? I think that there are a lot more studios that are now at least contemplating how they can shift their practices. In fact, I partnered with a white yoga studio owner and we created a six week training session where we're coming together to model what it looks like to actually collaborate with someone who's different from you. So what I'm realizing, and we have about 30 people that have signed up for our program What I'm learning is that now people are open to having these conversations about the disparities that are present in healthcare, the disparities that are present in the yoga community. So my hope is that this will not just be for a period of time, that will continue to increase the number of people of color that have access to yoga and yoga therapy to become yoga teachers and yoga therapists and also directors of yoga therapy training programs and yoga teacher training programs. And so it sounds like you're really doing all you can and kind of have been from the beginning to really make this genuine lasting change that's actually going to improve people's lives and people from every walk of life to kind of have that shared human experience rather than one of division and separateness, which I guess is at the heart of the yoga practice. And I know that that division was not coming from you. It was coming from the white community. I would like to also just 
unpack a little bit more. Like it seems like there's another layer to all of this where you have the extra challenges of just living life as a black woman in America today and then you put the extra energy into creating a better world and a better community for everyone, people of all different races, and you also like have your own family life. And we've already spoken quite a bit about balance and about self-care. Is Are these different states of mind that you kind of shift between? Like now I'm doing my community work, now this is my family time, now this is my work life, or is it quite holistic and this is just how you move through the world, kind of drawing from all of these different aspects of who you are and the offerings that you share? Hopefully that wasn't yes. too much of a confusing no, question. No, no, it's a, it's a great question, actually. So really, I operate in a combination of the two. Because of my intersectionality of being a Black woman and because I am a mother and a wife and a spiritual leader and all the other components of my life, it's definitely holistic for me. I I live yoga. I mean, it really I'm really embody all aspects of the yoga sutras and the Bhagavad Gita. But the biggest lesson, if I go back to how I came to yoga, remember I was stressed out. I didn't have any boundaries. I was sleeping with my Blackberry. I didn't know how to honor my family and also honor my engineering career as well. And so the biggest lesson that I got from yoga was how to live in the present moment. And so that means when I'm being a mother, I'm being a mother. I'm not receiving phone calls from the studio. I'm not thinking about my engineering job. I am present for my children. And this was a big change for me. I remember explicitly situations where I was having what I called my one-on-one time with each one of my children. But if my cell phone rang, if my engineering job call, then I stopped paying attention to my children. So now my life is holistic because I'm committed to all of the parts of who I am, but I do it from a very present moment perspective. I am present for each facet of my life. I think that's such powerful advice because it's like you can do it all, but not all at once. (laughs) That's right. That's really what it comes down to. And that's when my brain says, hello, you're you're multitasking here. You're thinking about this and that. And that's when I know my brain is telling me, Marsha, take a moment, sit down, take a nap, drink a cup of tea, reset yourself, look at your prioritized list of what you're going to work on today and work on the first thing, not all of it at the same time. And so another curveball that's hit all of us in 2020 is COVID-19 and it's definitely a challenge for everyone and a real challenge for small business owners and yoga studio owners and teachers. We're just coming out of a long lockdown and kind of thinking about reopening. What have your experiences been like at your studio and Do you have any advice in terms of communication and strategy for a smooth and safe reopening, or are you still online? Yes. Wow. COVID has really impacted my studio pretty harshly. I'm still operating from a virtual perspective. As a yoga therapist, most of the clients that I work with have medical conditions, And so their doctors have actually explicitly told them that they can't come back into the spaces until the world is in a better place. And so part of the thing that makes my studio unique is the community aspect. So I've had to bring my tea into my Zoom session. So I <laughs> actually so I actually meet with my clients over tea. We have like standing meetings where we can just really be present, but it's really hard being a small business owner. This question is actually a little emotional for me because I don't know what the status will be for, I have two buildings that I have a lease on and I understand that the landlords are impacted by the the negative financial status of all studios, including my own too. So right now the struggle is really about wanting businesses 
like landlords and people that own property to operate from a yogic perspective and really to understand that the work that we're doing is really a service. And because of COVID, the the financial status is just really, really negative right now. But I haven't given up on hope on this at all. I'm so fortunate to have very, very loyal clients. I mean, my attendance has dropped significantly. My financial intake has dropped significantly. But the people that are present, they're still benefiting from the amazing offerings that we have. And I can tell you that there's a there's an uptake that's going to occur in this world. That's what the sutras tells us, right? To continue to do the work, to trust, and to know that it will all work out. So while I don't have specific strategies right now about reopening, I think we have to tie that present moment concept back into this time period. And right now, we have to do what's safe and healthy for our clients. And so... Our, my strategy really is to continue to hold space for those that are of greatest need, marginalized communities, my aging population, my professionals that are executive leaders and really bringing about major change in this world. So that's kind of where I am. I'm holding space for all landlords. I'm holding space for all the other yoga studios. I don't know about where you guys are, but in the U.S., a lot of yoga studios are closing. So I've, I'm holding space for those owners that are losing the opportunity to operate their, their studios out of physical spaces. And I'm holding space for people that can literally give to make sure that the yoga world is still intact whenever we get through this COVID-19 situation. Thank you so much for that beautiful offering for teachers everywhere when you're going through it yourself to kind of offer that love and support for your community, including the members of your community who you don't know personally but feel connected to through this practice. From hearing about some of your offerings, I actually just assumed that you were doing in person when you mentioned the inclusive conversations that you're creating with community. So is that all online? It has transitioned to all online right now. I mean, pre-COVID, yes, we've had lots of people in the space and the inclusivity was held that way. But what happens with COVID is that now it's become more global. I have people that are in my teacher training program that are in South Carolina, Florida, Georgia. So basically my imprint of holding space for inclusive and inclusivity has increased. So now there are a lot of BIPOC members in this world that are reaching out to me because they're like, oh, I didn't know that there was a black yoga therapist, or I didn't know that you own two yoga studios. And so now I'm able to mentor a lot more people that don't live in the city of Alexandria. So I love that piece of it. And I love hearing about how you still open with the tea and with the conversation and kind of create that warm supporting environment that way. Are there any other things that you consciously do on those Zoom calls to help people feel connected to community when we're all in our own lounge rooms? Yes, I definitely do. I mean, my clients, especially my aging population clients, they, a lot of them are living by themselves or they're caring for other people that need them. And so at the beginning, actually, sometimes 50% of the class is really a sharing experience where people come in, they talk about how this COVID um, time is impacting their lives. And so I literally hold space for each client. So if it takes 30 minutes, 40 minutes for each person that signed into my class to talk, and people are talking about aging clients, their parents who are living in, and like, I forgot what they're called, like retirement homes. I have clients that are talking about losing sons People actually come online and talk about how they're anxious and how they're feeling depressed. And so for every single class that I teach, every person that's present will be seen and heard. Every person shares and we talk until people feel better. And then we add some asana in the physical movement. So that's really the most critical part of how we're maintaining community is not being 
guided specifically by saying you have to have a certain percentage of movement in class in order to do yoga. You know, yoga is based on the eight limbs. So we literally just come together as a community. Sometimes people cry. Sometimes people are sad because they've experienced loss in their life, whether it's their job or their home. Maybe they've lost a son or maybe they've lost a job as the way that it used to be. So holding space, what I call my compassionate sharing experiences, is really what I do for every single class, regardless of how long it takes. And how have you found your older clients have gone navigating the technology? I've had I've had mixed experiences <laughs> with the people that I've been working with, but I'd love to hear if you've had any strategies or practices that have made it kind of easier for them and therefore for you. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for asking that. You definitely caused me to chuckle there. In the beginning, it was challenging. I literally met with each client individually, showed them what the app store was in order to connect with Zoom and to add it to their devices. Some clients, yeah, we definitely we definitely struggled in the beginning. And one of my clients actually generated like an ebook to help clients step by step. So every week we would come together and add to that little virtual book of step one, you need to decide if you're going to use your cell phone or computer. Some of my clients didn't have computers in their homes. So they had to make a purchase in order to be able to actually participate in class because they couldn't see the they couldn't see the class in person like the way they were used to and the phone was too little so really that individualized attention is what i had to do i met with each client and i still do i keep my cell phone right beside me because sometimes they've logged in for 10 times straight this includes myself i don't know about you guys but sometimes i log in and it works perfectly and then the next time there's some little glitch so we really hold space we're patient for each other with each other we're patient to know that if technology's not working we just log out and try it again Nice. Yes, we have definitely had those experiences. And just switch your computer off, switch it on again, give it another try is what fixes it like 95% of the time. Exactly. You know, when you call the help desk and they say, have you turned your computer off and reboot it? So that's what I do. I've actually, now I log in with multiple devices so that if one device goes down, I have like a two backup system. That's where my engineering helps, you know. <laughs> so I have multiple devices is set up because I know something's going to happen. And so you work with some visually impaired people as well, right? Because I have yes. one of my, I've been teaching this lovely man and his wife, I think maybe almost 10 years, and he just didn't want to do any online at all because he didn't feel like he could see the screen well enough to be able to follow. And luckily, because we've been working together for so long, he was just happy to do his own practice through that time. How have you navigated this with your clients who might be blind or visually impaired? Yes, well, that's a great question. Actually, the two clients that I've been working with the longest, they actually went through my yoga teacher training program. And so it's really cool because when they contact me for classes, they actually are teaching me as well. And so it's really cool that we laid that foundation before. And their biggest thing is the technology, just like my aging population. So once they get their phone or their tablet to allow them to log into the system, then it's just like old times. <laughs> then they kind of joke with me and they're like, now you know what it feels like because <laughs> your system is not working. You can't see me always and I can't see you either. So that's kind of the relationship that we have. When I teach, I really teach in a very time sensitive manner, meaning that I take my time with the posture. So if I'm teaching someone who's visually impaired or aging population or someone is brand new to yoga, because I get a lot of people that are intimidated by this practice of yoga. So I just take my time. We may be in tree pose for five minutes of like plant through your right foot 
come to the ball of your left foot. Let your left heel come to the inside of your right leg. So it's really intentional and slow communication about each step in the process. And that works for my visually implied, visually impaired clients, as well as for those that are new to yoga. Beautiful. And I think a great little microcosm of the patience and present moment awareness Mm -hmm. (laughs) needed for all of us. (laughs) You've already mentioned one positive that's come out of this really challenging time, being able to connect with people beyond your immediate geographical area. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that has kind of come to your awareness through this time? as a human being and as a yoga teacher and therapist? Yes. Well, the greatest thing that has happened is that my family members from all over have been able to log into my classes because they're working from home now or recently retired. So family members that live in North Carolina or New Jersey, all over the place. So now I get to see extended family members that are taking advantage of my yoga class. And that really has brought a different perspective to community. My yoga community, they're like, these are your real aunts and uncles and cousins. I'm like, yes, they're actually my family members. So that's what I really love about this is now It helps with the intersectionality piece. I don't have to just talk about my both, both of my families. I talk about my yoga family and my biological family and they get to meet each other. And it's, excuse me, it's so cool. They talk about gardening and helping each other. So I really love that. Beautiful. I guess I've got another question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but obviously as we record this, there's going to be an election finishing up in a couple of days. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Yes, I definitely do. In fact, I am a supervisor for a trauma training program where I mentor people that are becoming trauma sensitive yoga teachers or facilitators actually. And that's really the biggest question that has been coming up. How do we really approach the election that's occurring on Tuesday. And for me, I'm so grateful. I have to go back to the sutras, to the yoga philosophy. When we accept people, even if they're different from us, then our peace is not disturbed. And so with this election that's coming up on Tuesday, I'm at peace about it because whatever's supposed to happen will happen. And that's what I learned from yoga. Yoga taught me to literally accept what's happening in the moment and to trust that there will be safety for all beings, to trust that even if people don't necessarily agree explicitly with what my thought patterns are, it's okay because it's really not about me. It's about honoring every being. And so for me, the election really is an opportunity to really practice holding space for all beings and to shift the energy so that people can be compassionate towards each other, even if they don't agree with each other. That's beautiful. No, that's fantastic. So I guess I've got one more question. And you might have already touched on this already. We saved this question for last, but I guess if you could distill everything that you teach and everything that you've learned down to one core essence, what do you think that one thing would be? The core one thing for me would be tapping into your authentic self. For me, I didn't know who I really was. I just was going after all of these goals in my life. I did not understand that when I was able to figure out who I was and to love myself and accept myself, then everything else would fall into place. So uncovering our own authentic self, that's the one thing that drills down for me. Oh, such a beautiful and powerful message. And thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us this morning, Marsha. It's been such an inspiring conversation and it's been so nice getting to know you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really have enjoyed this opportunity. It's my honor to be able to collaborate with you and thank you for all the work that you're doing in this world as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Marsha. As I said at the start of the episode, I just find her super inspiring and I really hope that you do too. 
For our next episode, we're speaking with Chara Carruthers and Maria Kirsten. Maria and Chara are both incredible yoga teachers and the co-hosts of the podcast, Live Like You Love Yourself. We recorded an interview for their podcast as well, and this episode kind of flows on from there. So look out for both of these episodes in the next couple of weeks. Our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thank you so, so much for listening. Joe and I really appreciate you spending your precious time with us. Aroha nui. Big, big love.